This is episode 46 of the Rise Up Podcast. We're a morning radio show hosted by Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life, a network of stations across New York and Pennsylvania. Our podcast is a weekly conversation that will help you think and grow in your faith. If you haven't already, subscribe today so you don't miss a single episode and find out more about our show at familylife.org. We weren't sure how you liked your coffee, so we didn't make any. Hope that's okay. It's Rise Up with Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life. Shall I sing my favorite song or? <laughs> well, okay, that's, I have thoughts about that. I guess we could, but, you know, we hear so many Christmas songs, obviously. Mm. What Christmas carol, what Christmas song that you hear now that you could hear all year round and never get tired of it? Therese, do you have one that uh, pops into your mind? You know, for me, when I really listen to the lyrics of Hark the Herald Angels Sing, it strikes me in such a profound way. And this is where I love, like, when you go to church during this time of year and they'll do a carol, you know, because you get to see those words. And it's like, wow, you're hearing them sung in this big group of people. And it really starts to speak to my heart. I've never been the kind of person who listens to Christmas music all year. Mm -hmm. But there is something to listening to some of these you know, theologically based carols outside of the Christmas season, because I think we get so busy this time of year that we aren't really thinking the full picture. You know, the Bible is really a complete story that's all about Jesus, you know, from the people's need for a savior, for all the rules that they had to follow to be worthy of heaven to the birth of Christ. But the story is not over at Christmas. We know that we have the life of Christ the death, burial, the resurrection of Christ. So hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. He is the king from the moment of birth, fully God and fully man. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. This birth of this Savior, this Jesus, is the point in history where the rules were no longer required, where grace overtook all of that legalese of, of how you become worthy of God. This one life would make all the difference. Mild, he lays his glory by, born that man no more shall die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. And this gift that we have of being able to surrender our lives to Jesus, to be born again, is such a tremendous thing. And it couldn't have happened without the birth. Now, we could say it couldn't have happened without the cross either. You know, mm -hmm. it couldn't have happened without the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. But both are significant. And so I think that we tend to look at Easter as this holy time. And then Christmas tends to be a lot about traditions and rituals. Yeah, But there's something so deeply holy about this birth, this virgin birth, this sinless human, fully human, that came to the world at Christmas for the purpose of rescuing us from our sins. There's also something in the main line, hark, the herald angels sing, that we forget during the holidays, if you really want to hear God speaking to you, mm -hmm. sometimes you need to find some quiet. Yeah. You know, <laughs> that word hark, yeah. it's like stop mm -hmm. and listen. And we get busy. Sometimes we yeah. forget to stop and listen. So true. Uh, Christmas songs that you could hear, or a Christmas song or a lyric that hit you, Tim, that you could listen to all year well, it's, it, you, As you put it, Therese, that it's easier to think about the fun of Christmas and like the sacredness of Easter. When I think about there are those two kinds of songs for Christmas. There's a the fun and there's a the sacred. And the fun kind are the ones that I find myself humming throughout the year. And I mm -hmm. usually get an elbow from my wife for doing that. She's like, it is not Christmas yet. You can't be humming that right now. But the ones I would find myself wanting to maybe sing like in church throughout the year, I'd love to I'd love it if we flipped open the hymnal to Joy to the World at any time because the author of the hymn Joy to the World, Isaac Watts, he didn't write it for Christmas. He actually wrote it as an adaptation of a psalm. This I just learned how interesting this is. He did this project where he went back through the psalms and he wrote them, kind of rewrote them as poems in light of what we know about Jesus in the New Testament, like the fulfilled prophecy, the Messiah who's come. And Psalm 98 is the one he went back to and wrote it in light of the Lord's coming and, yes, also the Lord's return. 
Psalm 98 is one that talks about the whole earth praising God, because like, as we know, creation itself, the whole creation was affected by sin. It's not just our hearts. It's like the physical world. Nature was affected by sin. And the word also tells us that, yeah, nature is Nature's pretty excited about Jesus, looking forward to Jesus coming back. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth, is what Psalm 98 says. And it says, let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who dwell in it, let the rivers clap their hands. Like nature's really looking forward to Jesus coming back. And that's what you see in Joy to the World, where we've got lyrics about fields and floods, rocks, hills and plains repeat the sounding joy. And it's just a special image to me that it's like, it's beautiful to think about at Christmas. Absolutely. Maybe as you think about the resounding joy of the angel's words, but it's a truth that should echo through all of our experience because we're all looking forward to Jesus coming back any time of year. So that's one I'd, I'd love to pick. One uh, that stands out for me for so many different reasons, um, most of them personally, uh, is Silent Night. And Therese, you already mentioned, everybody knows about the hectic time of year and it's almost like you have that hectic thing going on and i challenge anyone to have be hectic feeling and then all of a sudden sing or listen to silent night and not get that heavenly peace silent night holy night all is calm all is bright you picture that birth of jesus i can't imagine uh (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I can. We've all been around births of our children. Sometimes that birth process is not the most calming thing. There's a lot of activity going on, right? There's a lot of things. But in the midst of that, the calm and the peace of that song, it's even been told the true story of uh, two sides of a war took one night out in the middle to sing Silent Night. And the two sides in this war, these two countries stopped uh, the war for singing mm-hmm. Silent Night, Holy Night. Now, the personal things for me One, there's several things. One, it's the first song that I heard my little child, our first child, Laura, sing in a Christmas play. She sang Silent Night. So it's like to hear your child for the first time sing in front of a church, you know, and that's like, so so that is obviously a, a memory. Two, uh, it's also that, and many people have experienced this, the uh, the last song at the Christmas Eve service where you're all holding the candles and right. you have the candles and the church yeah. goes dark and you're singing Silent Night. Well, in the midst of all that, I've always been afraid of fire. And um, <laughs> there was one Same. there was one Christmas that I'll never forget. We're singing Silent Night and they didn't have the hard plastic things yet. It was just the paper holders underneath. Oh, boy. Uh-huh. Right. And so, and there's a carpeted floor. And so I'm sitting there holding the candle out. I think the candle knew that i was nervous because i was like <laughs> right. well, you know. anyway the the wax drips the down wax the wax down. drips down oh. hits the paper cup there to hold it and it gets on fire it's <gasps> like it's on fire and i'm like ah and but meanwhile silent <laughs> is going on and i i throw it to the floor oh that's not good no it's not especially no. with carpet and the carpet right. starts burning a little bit i'm, oh, I'm boy. stepping it out <laughs> meanwhile holy night nice so in the section. midst all is bright though i'll tell you that right in the midst of all that there was this calming spirit that that was a very hectic time for me um and so anyway i'm glad they went to the hard plastic after that and didn't get the drippings of the wax sleep in anyway. heavenly right. peace oh, sleep in heavenly peace and the last one uh, as we tape this i have not experienced it yet but it's been on my bucket list for several years and i'm looking forward to it there's a small christian university in upland indiana called taylor university And this is the 25th anniversary of this, what I think is the greatest sports tradition that's not known around the country. They have a thing, right, the Friday before their finals begin at Taylor University, 2,500 students, and they call it Silent Night. And what they do, it started out a tradition a long time ago. It gets bigger and bigger and bigger. There have been national features on this. You can Google it, uh, YouTube, and look at Silent Night Taylor University. They dress up in, in outfits. It's supposed to be like a big pajama party for the entire student body. Oh. So they get all dressed up, and every year it's more creative. And they're in, they come to the game. But for the, it's called Silent Night. So for the first part of the game, up until they get 10 points, they can't cheer. They don't cheer. It's silent. Wow. All you hear is the screeching of the sneakers and maybe uh-huh. the players, whatever. And then as soon as it hits the 10th point <sighs> tradition they got, they storm the court. Everybody runs out of the stands and goes. Oh, my goodness. So it's, it's an amazing thing to watch. But here's what I'm really looking forward to. Then with about somewhere about three or four minutes left in the game, the entire student body, 2,500 of them, arm in arm and all around the stands, as the game's going on, 
sing all the verses of Silent Night as the game's going on. And to hear 2,500 students arm in arm at this Christian university in Upland, Indiana, sing Silent Night, it's just, I've seen this on video so many times, and I'm like, I want to go. And again, as we uh, tape this podcast a few days from now, I'll be attending that, and I look forward to even bringing back some audio uh, from that. Just to, I'm just looking forward to it. So Silent Night has so many different wonderful meanings that no matter the chaos of, I don't know, a burning candle on the rug or a birth of a child or a basketball game going on, Silent mm-hmm. Night, there's something about that so tender and mild and that heavenly peace that only comes from Jesus. It's Steve, Therese, and Tim, helping you to rise up on family life, a friend you can turn to. Ooh, you know that moment when you realize, it's not me. You know, like it's not it's not something that's wrong oh, with yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. That's You're a relief. Like, oh, yes. Here's I've never had thing. that moment, by the way. It's always Stop. you. <laughs> it's not always you. Okay, the mm. most common street name in the United oh. States. It's oh. gotta be. It's gotta be your name. It's, you would think it, Main, Street, Main Street, but it's not. No, 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 oh, it's no. Not no. you? Huh. Nope. And when I tell you what it is, you're gonna be like, huh? Okay, the most common street name in the U.S. is Second Street. Ah, uh, that that doesn't make any sense. No, it doesn't. The second it most common name for a street yeah. is Third Street. Oh boy! And then the third most <laughs> yeah. common name yeah. is First Street. <laughs> So second is first, yeah. third is second, uh-huh. first is third. Uh, oh, yeah. And, wow. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Uh-huh. The reason I get lost mm-hmm. is not my fault. <laughs> it is not me. Okay. First is on third. Uh, first, third. Like Who's on main? Yeah. I, they, nobody. No, <laughs> uh, I don't know. It's not you. It's not you. We hope the rest of your day is just as much fun as this. You're listening to Rise Up on Family Life. You know, if you live long enough, you think you've heard of everything. I had never heard, when I saw about an 18-foot world record pupusa, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, P-U-P-U-S-A, 18-foot uh-huh. pupusa. I had to keep reading on because I have never heard of a, a, a pupusa, pupusa, you know, I, anybody? Right. Anybody? I would think it's like a boat, like a canoe. Okay. Uh, that's 18-foot. That's pretty good. Yeah. Um, right. Tim, you're allowed to my make guess, it. My guess would be it's some kind of food. You win. Hey! Okay. And I, wow. didn't know, I thought it was like a snake or an animal or something. Right. Oh, a sure. Pupusa. Reasonable. Yeah, but uh, Tim, uh, you're right. El Salvador, uh, a town there, they made a uh, 18-foot pupusa. It's a tortilla-like flatbread filled with beans, cheese, and meat. Uh, yeah, well, it's like yeah. a crunch wrap. I'll take a, I'll take a, <laughs> I'll take a foot if they got one you know, extra. Hold on, hold on, take good. that back. Hold on, they've set a world record for an 18-foot <laughs> crunch wrap. Wow, that's <laughs> impressive. <laughs> They're morning people because they love mornings and people. It's Rise Up with Steve, Therese, and Tim on Family Life. Some things might stick out to you if you went back in time. It wouldn't be like you expected them to. I'm thinking of Abraham Lincoln. I mean, this great man. He was tall. He was majestic in his presence. And he mm. had a falsetto voice. They say his voice was like really, really high pitched. Is that right? They say really? it sounded kind of like a boat whistle when he talked. Because <laughs> his like, mouth was so far up. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. Way up there. <laughs> it's not true. what I would expect. Huh. It's not what I would expect. No. And then the other thing, okay, going further back in time, or you go to see Napoleon Bonaparte. Oh yeah, the short guy, right? No, actually. You're right. They say historically, really, that's kind of off. He really wasn't very short of a guy. Five, six probably is what he was. Not too short. Mm-hmm. It's the things that we spend so much time thinking about, how mm-hmm. we look, how we sound. You think, oh, I don't like how my voice sounds. Or, oh, I bet people are impressed by my teeth. Whether you think it's a good <laughs> trait you have, mm-hmm. whether you think it's a bad trait you have, mm-hmm. that's not what people are going to remember about you. Oh. People are going to remember the things you did, how you right. made them feel, the kind of person you were. That's what matters. That's what people remember. Huh. I can't get it out of my head now. Four score and seven years ago. (laughs) Facing a whole new day is a lot easier when you remember that God is in charge. You're listening to Rise Up on Family Life. Hi, would you like to try a free hot cocoa sample? I'd love some. We've replaced the chocolate in our homemade hot cocoa with the Rise Up Kitchen's own zesty Italian dressing. Let's see if they notice. (laughs) I'm sorry, is it, is this vinegar? Oh, there's vinegar in it. You could tell? Would you like to try some hot cocoa? It's free. <gasps> sure. There you go. Warm you up for the season. Not what I expected. Take home a box today. Aisle three between Ranch and Caesar. 
I love Coco. Yes, please. <laughs> what is this? It's our special chocolate-free hot cocoa recipe with comforting notes of oregano and olive oil. Is it not your favorite? I don't even know if it's legal. Someone needs to make you guys some real hot chocolate. Uh, like the kind with, you know, chocolate in it. Call it what you want. What matters is what's inside. Being a Christian means Christ is in you. People should be able to tell the difference. A message from the Rise Up Kitchen. Uh, I don't think our sardine cinnamon rolls are going to go over very well. Mm-hmm.